Dead Night 6. What's up, everybody? I just inhaled a gnat right off the bat and I walked into a spider web. <clears throat> Batting a thousand so far here at the beginning of this video. <clears throat> so I'm up at the campground getting ready to just talk about a couple things and I had that feeling my spidey senses were telling me there's something back here in the woods watching. And I could hear footsteps and what sounded like something being thrown at me, like coming through the leaves, like rocks. And it wasn't, okay, it's too early for the acorns to fall. Uh, some hickories fell about a month ago. But the sounds being made were not the sounds of nuts dropping straight down. Rather, coming out through leaves. So, still going to talk about what I was going to talk about. But I'm going to slowly ease my way a little bit inside the forest so you can truly get my six. Let's see what's going on back here, if anything. And even though the sun is, is, is starting to set back here, excuse me, um, it is 95 degrees right now. So, uh... Here, here's a couple things. Hunker down here for a minute. Snats are following me like a dark cloud. So, uh, a few days ago, I did something, and my wife wasn't very happy about it. And uh, I already talked about it here in a video once a few days ago a couple days ago when I was reading shoot it might have been yesterday when I was reading one of the short stories from Bigfoot Sasquatch Files Anthology 1 Did you guys see that thing duck behind a tree so I mentioned about how you know it was like the second day of school our uh, creepy neighbor, the hay collector, came down to, to watch our kid get off the bus. <clears throat> the day before that, he actually was hanging out way up on top of the hill where his mommy and daddy's house is. He's like a world's oldest mom's boy, hangs out at mommy and daddy's all day. Um, <clears throat> he was observing, and I told my wife then, I said, he's looking to see what time the bus comes so he knows when he can come down and start harassing. Uh, <clears throat> wasn't very happy, I guess we called the couple government agencies and, and, and talk to him about something that he put on his field that killed our bees. So the bull, it was time for the bullying to start coming on again. So, uh, what I did, I mentioned in the video from yesterday is when the bus came and I went outside of our privacy hedge, which is now thick enough to where if we're back there, he can't see us from over there. But I made sure as I went to the bus that I recorded him with my cell phone. <laughs> The whole time my kid was getting off the bus and coming over and we went back up behind our privacy hedge. And so he just stared with his arms crossed and he said nothing. Well, that upset my wife a little bit. And uh, she thought that that was mean, what I did. And she thought that I was bullying him in return. And uh, I, I said to her, I said, listen, honey, I hate to have to do that to anybody. I hate to have to be that way with anybody. But... <clears throat> He's let us know exactly, thought I heard like a howl or a yell. Let's ease up here a little bit, where I thought I saw something dark behind a tree. Sounds like they might be trying to communicate with each other, with grunts or howls. So, but I explained to my wife, listen, here's the here's point. Uh, I didn't make this up on my own. I mean, it, it's wisdom that comes with experience, but basically I learned this from one man. Uh, his name was Eddie Baker. He was an E-7 in the Army, Sergeant First Class Eddie Baker. And he was my platoon sergeant when I was at Fort Lewis with the Warriors in Transition Battalion after I got home from Iraq. 
I had to have surgery and stuff when I was there for like six months. This guy, we're about the same age at the time, mid thirties. Uh, he was a big guy. He was about six two. He was a black man. He was built like a freaking army tank. Uh, I believe he was an infantryman. That was his MOS. He was our platoon sergeant. And on day one, uh, first formation, he told us, he said, he says, I will treat you exactly how you let me know you want to be treated. And I will know exactly how you want to be treated based upon the way you treat me. He said, if you treat me like a man, I'll treat you like a man. You treat me with respect, I'll treat you with respect. But if you disrespect me and you're all laid up, it's a military term for meaning like you don't have your crap straight, you're not disciplined, you're, you know, always late and all that. <clears throat> well, I don't know if there's anybody in the military that's always late. They weed those dirt bags out pretty easy, pretty early on. But uh, he says, I, I will be your worst nightmare the whole time you're here. If you, if you disrespect me, I will disrespect you. So I, I thought, well, and like I said, I was in my mid-30s by that time, older than a lot of the guys there. Uh, I thought, well, that's pretty, pretty easy to follow, uh, and I'm going to treat this man with the same respect I would treat any E7. I was an E4 or any other human being I come in contact with because I kind of thought, you know, I have this uh, very similar mentality. I just never worded it like that. So... <clears throat> The whole time I was there for six months, you know, I always answered yes, sergeant, no sergeant, did what I was supposed to do. And uh, things were a little lax there because most of the time we were going to doctor's appointments, rehab sessions, anger management, therapy, all kinds of stuff. So I got to know this guy, Sergeant First Class Baker, uh, a little more personally than I would have like an E7 in my regular unit. <laughs> I didn't like that guy at all. He was a dirt bag. He's one of these guys when he put his body armors on, body armor, he couldn't fit in an up armor to Humvee. Um, I think they've since started getting rid of these guys. But anyway, um, I never had a problem with uh, Sergeant First Class Baker. Uh, he would encourage me to get involved in, in group type stuff so I wasn't alone isolating in my dorm room. Uh, he encouraged me to go to some Seattle Seahawks football games. Like people would donate tickets to our, our uh, outfit there, the Warriors in Transition Battalion. And uh, so I would go to some Seattle Seahawks football games. And, and he really was a big help to me. And he explained how like the worst place you can be, especially when you're in any sort of transition, any sort of, you know, plan changing event. I don't want to say life changing event, but things that happen certainly resulted in me changing my plans. Uh, he said, the worst thing you can do is spend all the time alone in your, in your own head thinking about your problems or your issues. And so he, he was a great guy. He treated me with respect and he treated me like a man. That's how I treated him. Now, I remember a, a couple of guys in our unit who had bad attitudes. And they displayed those bad attitudes with uh, Sergeant First Class Baker on day one. And until the time I left, six months later, they got to see how mean and nasty he could be. And we talked about it once because there was one guy in particular that wasn't a bad guy, but he did have a bad attitude. He was younger, hadn't had a lot of life experiences before he went to war and got messed up. And uh, I used to try to talk to this guy. And I, he, was, he wasn't a bad guy at all, but he just he had issues when it came to respecting authority. So I remember talking to Sergeant First Class Eddie Baker about this once. And I said, you know, this guy, have you thought, Sergeant, about maybe letting up on him? He's not a bad guy. And he says, I know he's not a bad guy, but he's let me know what he thinks of me. And he lets me know how far he'll push if he's given an inch. He's, and he explained to me, he's just one of these kind of guys that will confuse kindness for weakness he said i don't like being mean to anybody but there are some some people who just that's the only thing they understand they don't get any other way and uh it, 
he he's talking about borrowing trouble don't don't make other people's problems your problems he says their bad attitude their negative outlook on life their disrespectful authority that's their problems that's their issues and i'm going to allow them to keep them by not taking any of it to carry for them <clears throat> And so I was explaining this to Dearly the other day. After I went down, I got our son from the bus, uh, recorded that dirt bag the whole time he was there. And I said, Dearly, I don't like to treat anybody like that either. I never once in a million years said, I hope we're going to go move out in the country and have that one a-hole neighbor that just likes to be an a-hole to everybody that I'm going to have to completely ignore and act like he's not there unless if he does get into our physical presence with his passive-aggressive uh, narcissistic forms of bullying, I've got to let him know, no, no. So, he knew he was being recorded, and guess what? He hasn't come back. He hasn't come back. Now, he might, and if he does, I'll break my phone out again. Now, if any of the other people that live around here just happen to be down that way, and one of my kids getting off the bus, am I going to break the phone out? And rec Absolutely not. Absolutely not because they have not shown me that that's the treatment they desire to be given because they've not treated me with aggressive, nasty, mean uh, behavior. <clears throat> now, but here's what the hay collector has been doing the last couple days. Actually following the bus in his car and yelling at the bus driver for not putting his thing that comes out that says stop out in time. Yeah, true story. You talk about a lunatic, right? Speaking of which, the lunatic, we have print copies in stock now available to be autographed if you get them from the link in our Etsy store. Whatever that thing was, it just messed up my self-promotion. All right. So anyway, dearly kind of got it when I explained that to her, and I told her I, I didn't make the, I didn't make this stuff up. I learned it from Sergeant Baker, Sergeant First Class Baker. <clears throat> she's like, yeah, I get it, I know, because she she's known people like that in her life who are just very difficult, you know, and they'll push and they'll push and they'll push, and then you push back and then they stop pushing, but then they'll let up and they'll let time go by and they'll come and give you a little nudge. You got to push back again, or, or it's just going to be like where it was the last time. So, but anyway. <clears throat> There is something I wanted to tell you about my son. I'm so proud of him. And that uh, $15,000 trip him and his mom took to the Philippines this summer for three months was worth every penny. It was worth every penny for them to get to see their family over there again and, and have those experiences. But here's one of the biggest concerns we had with him. Uh, and, and I saw that... The, the, we achieved our objective, we achieved our goal. Our kid is a great kid. He's respectful, he's disciplined, he's well-behaved. Of course, everybody says this about their kids. Everybody's biased, right? He, uh, he's not materialistic, he's not consumeristic. He isn't one of these kids that just wants everything, you know? And uh, a lot of that is from the fact that the first five years of his life, we were third world, world poor in the Philippines. And, uh, it was consumerism and materialism was never a part of his life it's never been a part of my life or my wife's life <clears throat> but we were becoming concerned because we now live you know while we're here in the u.s we're in a affluent area here in, outside of charlottesville he hasn't become consumeristic and he hasn't become greedy or materialistic but what he sees around him here is so different than what he would see around him there in the Philippines. And we'd been here for so long, he'd forgotten that adjunct poverty. And we're surrounded by wonderful people, good people who are deserving of everything they have because they work for it, um, but they have a lot. And like a lot of his friends, I remember the first time we went to one of his friend's houses, like when he started kindergarten, like his first play date, like this kid, he, the kid had like a bedroom, but then the kid also had like a toy room just for all his toys. And I remember when we walked in there, there were more toys in that room than in any toy store we had ever been in in the Philippines. And we even said that. And, uh, of course, the parents were talking about, you know, he's got, you know, all these relatives. They're always, you know, spoiling him and all this stuff. And he's a good kid. 
that kid, by the way, he's a very good kid. Um, good parents. Uh, he just has a lot of stuff. And but I told you know on the way home, Darlene and Daniel, were, Daniel were talking about all this stuff. I said, guys, you're going to see that everywhere we go. I mean, we're not we're in America now, but we're also in Charlottesville. And sure enough, other friends had all this stuff, all this stuff. Well, I was afraid that that our son was going to forget how the how 80% of the world lived. You know, it's a common expression here. You hear people talk about how the other half live. It's not the other half. It's the other 97%. 80% of the world's population live on less than $2 a day. And so we were afraid, you know, not that Daniel was going to become um, ungrateful. or Well, yeah, that, that was the concern. Uh, that he would lack gratitude. That he would just be grateful for everything he has in his life. Uh, so he got over there to the Philippines. He spent three months over there this summer. Got reacquainted with his cousins, his nieces, or his aunts, his uncles, um, and that lifestyle. And he got to see uh, a place where everybody's needs are not just automatically met daily. Uh, there are no EBT cards. There are no Obama phones. And there is no such thing as if you're, you know, below the poverty level, you get free health care. Um, now, you do, you do get treated here, fortunately. But you have to pay for it unless you're like adjunct poverty which here in this country if you're in adjunct poverty as you know you get free housing and free food and all this other stuff over there when you're in adjunct poverty it's just that adjunct poverty there's no free food there's no free housing there's no cell phones and you die if you get sick and don't have the money to pay for the treatment so <clears throat> this all comes back to this point like I said, Daniel, he's, he's like me and his mom. He's not consumeristic. He's not materialistic. He doesn't have a bunch of stuff that he just doesn't need. But he does have stuff, right? Uh, he's got a bedroom, and it's full. There's not really much room for anything else. He doesn't have a whole other room for toys, but he's got plenty of, plenty of his own stuff. So uh, while they were in the Philippines, a lot of you folks watching this mailed a lot of stuff to me. Like almost daily, we were getting stuff in the mail tools, equipment, stuff for out here. Uh, but a lot of people were also sending toys for Daniel. And this has been going on ever since we set our P.O. box up almost a year ago. And um, he would get a toy that we knew he wasn't really, he wasn't going to be into it. And we would be like, hey, because about every, about twice a year, Dearly sends these big boxes full of supplies and goods and treats over to her family in the Philippines. So we would always try to encourage Daniel, hey, why don't we take this and why don't we send this to the Philippines because you've got, you know, all this stuff already. And he'd say, no, because our viewers sent that to me. I want that. And, well, okay, we weren't going to make him. We were trying to encourage him, you know, but we would never make him give his stuff to anyone else. Uh, that's just not who we are. Um, but anyway, they went to the Philippines. They came back. There was all this stuff just piled up upstairs that, that folks had, had sent him. And he went through it, he looked through it, and, and some of it he's playing with quite a bit. Well, there's about half of it that he hasn't touched, and he, he just hasn't opened because it's just not his thing. So a couple days ago, um, I said to him, because we were in his room, and I was like, you know, where are we going to put all this stuff? We need to figure out a place to put this stuff. He goes, oh, put it in, in that box downstairs Mom's going to send to the Philippines. And he had never said that before. And I was like, you don't want it? He goes, well, I like it. And, and I, I mean, I kind of want it. But he said, he looks at me, he goes, Dad, do you know all those kids that live in Mom and Dad's parents' house? I'm like, yeah. And she, he goes, do you know they only have one toy? And it's a truck about this big, and it only has three wheels. He says, I'm sending them all those toys. And that's what he's doing. That's what we're doing with it. Uh, so the lesson took. The $15,000 three-month vacation in the Philippines was absolutely worth every penny because he was reminded of what life is like for so many others. Uh, and it was good to see that out of the kindness of, of his heart, he wants to give those things he has that he knows he doesn't need to, to folks who have not. And uh, I'm glad I could, my wife, I was allowed to, bring my wife around to the understanding that I'm not going to be mean to everybody. I'm just going to be mean to people who are mean to me. If, you know, they, if it's required, I mean, avoidance is my number one policy, but when a man just keeps coming at you, I mean, we stalking your kid to know what time he can stand right across the road from you and stare at you. And I'm sure he would have threatened or 
said said lots of things had the phone not come out so sergeant first class eddie baker i will treat you the way you let me know you want to be treated and you will let me know how you want to be treated based upon how you treat me see you for more next time